How's it going, everyone? This is International Master Daniel Wrench. This is Chess.com, and this is everything you need to know about the opening stage of a chess game. Before we go any further, you should know that this video series was created for 90% of the world's chess players. Those of you who learned how the pieces move, the relative values of each respective chess man, and that the ultimate goal of the game is to checkmate the enemy king. But most people never have an opportunity to learn even the most basic strategies, let alone receive any insight into the higher levels of chess understanding. With this video series, we intend to help you achieve just that. Most people never have even a single lesson with a chess pro. Well, the next four videos and the next 45 minutes are exactly that. This is the one chess lesson you need in your life if you were only to get one. Buckle up. Because over the next 45 minutes, we are going to bring you the most fundamental and vital chess knowledge that everyone needs to succeed, some grandmaster secrets along the way, as well as some practical advice about how you might bring this knowledge together in your own games. First up is going to be the opening stage video, which begins before move one. Secondly, we're going to bring you the middle game or tactics and strategy video. This might be one example of a possible middle game position. In the third video, we're going to move on to the final stage of a chess game, that being the end game, and again, this being an example of a possible end game. And finally, we're going to back up to show you two of the greatest chess games of all time by some of the best players in the history of our game, to show you how you might bring it all together in a practical setting. Let's jump right in. Though there are exceptions to this rule, the opening is generally considered to be complete when your rooks are connected. And so ignoring the fact that this is obviously an improbable position, focus on the fact that white is one move away from completing his development by castling to either side. Both moves would connect the rooks. Like all stages of a chess game, there are generally some principles and guidelines to follow as far as how to achieve your goals. And so here we've organized these principles for you to follow and try to apply in your own games. The first three rules to the opening, develop, develop, develop. Why the same rule over and over? Because it's that important. Arguably the most important piece of advice you'd ever be given is to use all of your pieces whenever you play a chess game. Development means to literally improve your position by expanding it. And both sides will typically try to develop their pieces as quickly as possible. Making some random moves here to see. Right now it's not so important where you're bringing your pieces. We're just going to try to show an example of how the pieces might be brought out into the game so that both sides might complete their development and get castled. The basic idea here is that both sides have completed their development by connecting their rooks and they both brought out their minor pieces first which is usually the easiest way to start fighting for control over a position. Like this dream position shows us, the rule number four as far as how to play the opening is to develop your pieces toward the center. This would be an ideal example of how in a perfect world if your opponent didn't challenge your your development and your goal you might develop your pieces to control the most important area of the board. Why is the center the most important area of the board? Let's use the Knights as an example. Every piece typically does better in the center than it does on the edge of the board. But the knights in particular really highlight this principle. As we can see here, white's knight on e4 is attacking or controlling, depending on how you look at it, up to eight territories. Whereas the, a knight on the corner is only attacking up to two. Though this is an extreme example, it should hopefully display for you that you would like to get every one of your pieces in the center where they're on their ideal squares if possible. And so now you likely understand why we would refer to this as a dream development for white. Obviously, both you and your opponent will be fighting to do this so much as far as to attack the center. So achieving a dream position like that is not completely practical. Let's go over a couple different examples of how players develop, both sides trying to attack the center. Here with the move e4, expanding, opening up diagonals, and attacking the center. Black following suit with the move e5, trying to do the same. White develops a piece to put pressure on the center, and black now develops a piece to defend the center. There are many options here at play, including moves like bishop to c4, which can lead toward a two knights or a joko piano. 
the move bishop b5, which is probably one of the most popular openings in the history of chess that Rui Lopez, as you can see by attacking the knight, we're indirectly increasing our control over these two squares. And there's also the four knights opening, which the moves have already been displayed once earlier in this video, and now we'll describe it as such that both sides are simply developing their pieces, their minor pieces first, which is the best way to do it. And they didn't just develop their pieces to random squares, but rather tried to bring them toward the center with both sides fighting for potential control over the most important squares. Again, why? As we reviewed, every piece will have better potential when in the center. And you'll notice that most mainline openings and all Grandmaster theory is contrived from this principle. Develop, develop, develop your pieces being the first three principles. And rule number four, let's develop them toward the center. We're halfway there, living on a prayer, and don't you dare change that channel. Our fifth rule goes very well in conjunction with the first four principles you've learned, and that is to never move a piece twice, at least not before move 10. The basic idea should be obvious. If both players are trying to fight as aggressively and accurately as they can over the center, it doesn't make sense to try to battle your opponent's entire army with one piece. For example, let's focus on a queen's pawn game, which, unlike e4, is slightly more geared to control the center with the pawns, after d5 by black, usually you'll see white follow up with a move like c4, with the idea being that if black already breaks the principle of moving a piece twice, he's given up control over the center. White will then attack the center, and we've already learned the value of the center, if you remember earlier in the video. So this should be clear to understand why this would be a nice opportunity for white. And after the pawn is recaptured pretty quickly, white is happy. So rather than move a piece twice, black will develop another pawn into the center with either e6 or c6 being the most popular options, choosing to defend the center rather than to relinquish it by moving a piece twice. White will continue to develop pieces with the same purpose of putting pressure on this critical point, trying to induce black to move a piece twice and therefore allow control over the center. Good players will continue to defend, and as we see, both players will continue developing pieces once again putting pressure on a piece that indirectly puts pressure on these critical squares. And again, rather than moving the knight away, which in this case would actually lose a large amount of material as the knight is pinned to the queen, black will continue to develop pieces to defend these critical points. And you'll notice after a few more moves of developing, neither side is considering moving a piece twice, but rather trying to bring their pieces into the middle part of the board and get castled as quickly as possible. Speaking of castling, I'm about to hit you with some big news. You ready? Principle number six is that both players should be able to get their kings castled, get their kings to safety by the first ten moves of every chess game they play, if not by the first seven moves. Most mainline openings, including the Queen's Gambit decline that I just showed you, back up to, let's say, the Rui Lopez, an opening we've already displayed. You'll notice that even as early as move four, white is already prepared to castle. And black, after developing his pieces, would not be too far behind from doing the same thing, perhaps defending the pawn, developing a piece, and getting castled. The main purpose of this is not to show you what is necessarily considered the best theoretical moves at the highest levels of chess, but to show you that the general principles can be followed and very good positions can be achieved before you even try to memorize opening variations. The four knights, another one that we've reviewed, you notice that both sides brought their pieces out and prepare to get castled once again. We're seeing both sides get castled here before we've even reached move five. To move on, hopefully the uh, concept that getting our king castled is obviously a good one is, is now clear. Let's talk about principle number seven, and that is in regards to the first lady of chess. Though I could likely give many examples as to why it's not the best idea to bring your queen out before the minor pieces have been developed or before you've been castled, I like to give one particularly instructive one. This example occurs when one player, the white player in this case, decides to play for the four-move checkmate, something that many amateur beginner players do. Obviously, if your opponent misses the idea behind the queen going back door on the knight and checkmating the king via the weakest square of seven, then white is successful. But if black plays good moves and white continues to be stubborn in the attack of the weakest square, particularly with this mistake of g4, trying to remove the knight to achieve the goal. Now we'll see why bringing the queen out so early was not the best idea. 
Black has the nice move d5, not only putting an attack on the bishop, but also opening up his own bishop to make a threat on g4. And after captures knight d4, queen d1, we see a position where white has moved the queen four times, including the attack on the queen. And a move like knight e2 would fall prey to a very famous trick of checkmate. And any other move would also leave white in a very bad position. Now, as we move on to our final three principles, it should be noted that the first seven are the most important. To develop, develop, develop your pieces, bring them toward the center, don't move anybody twice, and don't bring your queen out too early. When you combine those ideas with the simple act of castling, you're pretty much on the right road. So, our final principles could probably be considered advice and practical ideas as to how you should transition into the middle game as much as they should be considered opening ideas. For example, our eighth principle is to develop with a purpose. Essentially what that means is that all the mainline openings develop moves with a purpose. Grabbing the center, purpose to attack the pawn, purpose to defend the pawn, purpose to attack the knight who defends the pawn, that being the Rui Lopez which we already showed. Queen's Gambit was also an opening where you saw all the moves centered around the critical pressure of the center. Everybody was involved in either the attack or defense of these squares one way or another. Those are two very famous examples of openings that develop pieces with a purpose. And you should develop your pieces with purpose in your own games. The ninth principle is to watch out for your opponent's threats. We can talk about all these generalities, but the bottom line is, if you go sit down for a real game and your opponent brings the queen out early to attack the pawn, you might consider breaking the rule of moving a piece twice in order to win a large amount of material. Obviously, that's a silly example, but the point is to think about your opponent's threats beyond your own goals and principles in any position you play, whether it be the opening, middle game, or end game stage. Think about your opponent's moves and develop your pieces with a purpose. I consider principles 8 and 9 to go hand in hand in that sense, and you'll be on the right track. And finally, our 10th principle is in place basically to remind you of all the things you've learned in this video. If you think about it, the 10th principle of connect your rooks is essentially an insurance policy. Why? Because if you're in a position to connect your rooks, whether it be by castling or completing your development with another piece, by definition, that means that you've achieved your goals of the opening. You followed all the principles of developing your minor pieces, attacking the center hopefully, bringing the queen out only when it was time, and by finally safeguarding the king and connecting the rooks, you are ready to do battle in the middle game. In summary, let's review the principles you've learned in this video today. Develop, develop, develop. Not a single thing more needs to be said. You have to use your entire army in order to win chess games at any level. Control the center. This principle is in place to remind you that your pieces are best placed when they're in the middle of the board where the action ends. Don't move a piece twice. Moving even a single minor piece twice can steer you wrong and get you away from achieving your goals of developing all of your pieces. You must use your entire army. Castle early. In many cases, you can even achieve this before move 7, but certainly by move 10, you should be castled and your king safe. Don't bring the queen out too early. We saw an interesting example as to why it's not the best idea to use the first lady of chess so early in the game. Remember this and don't use the queen early unless completely necessary. Develop with a purpose. Essentially, your moves should have reason. Instead of just moving them to random squares, we saw in the Rui Lopez and the Queen's Gambit that all high-level openings, all grandmaster ideas, develop pieces with a plan and with a purpose. Think about your opponent moves and threats. Obviously, just bringing them out to random squares wouldn't be a good idea, and nor would it be a good idea to ignore your opponent's moves and threats. These principles are in place as guidelines to help you in your own games, but you have to think about your opponent's moves at the same time. Connect the rooks, the insurance policy that's there to remind us if we've connected the rooks, then we followed all these principles in this video and we are ready to rock and roll. Everything you need to know about the opening is now complete. We hope you enjoyed this video and we will see you around on chess.com.